Welcome everyone to the Tax Depreciation Webinar. The purpose of this session is to make you aware of tax rules for expensing vehicle purchases and leases. These expensing rules change from year to year, and as we approach year end, we will offer you considerations in timing your purchase and selecting the type of vehicle that fits your needs. I'm pleased to introduce today's presenters from the Office of Tax Affairs. My name is Nicholas Lloyd, and you'll also be hearing from Scott Sierkowski and Eugenia Cusimano. Please take a minute to look through our bios. Here you'll find our objectives for this session. After I've briefly defined depreciation and explained depreciation options, Scott is going to take us through the tax rules for expensing vehicle purchases. You'll learn why these rules are important and potential limitations on a taxpayer's depreciation deductions. Eugenia will take you through the various options available to highlight how different facts can lead to very different tax results. We'll also highlight other tax provisions, such as leasing, the electric vehicle credit, disposition of a vehicle, and record keeping requirements. We'll only be spending a few minutes on these topics, so be sure to contact your tax advisor for further information. Lastly, Scott will give you a sense of how the depreciation rules might be changing with proposed legislation and conclude our session with some key takeaways. When capital assets are used in a business operated for profit, the owners are permitted to recover the cost of the property by deducting from each year's revenue a portion of the property's cost. This deduction is more commonly referred to as depreciation. Depreciation represents the decline in the value of property that occurs over time and is caused by the use or deterioration of capital assets. In deciding on the method to be used in allocating depreciation, taxpayers may decide to take the largest permissible depreciation deduction in order to minimize taxable income and maximize the amount of tax-free cash available for reinvestment in the business. When looking at depreciation options, the two we'll talk about today are regular depreciation, sometimes called Modified Accelerated Cost Recovery System, or MAKERS, which has been in place since 1987. As the name suggests, this depreciation gives taxpayers an accelerated expensing of their basis in the property with a double declining balance recovery system. Section 179 gives certain taxpayers the option to expense some or all of their qualifying property in the tax year that the property is placed in service. Another depreciation option is bonus depreciation which allowed taxpayers to claim an expense for 50% of the cost of certain property placed in service during the year. Bonus depreciation expired at the end of 2013, so under current law, assets purchased in 2014 are not eligible for bonus depreciation. Lawmakers in both chambers of Congress have submitted proposed legislation to allow taxpayers to apply bonus depreciation to assets purchased in 2014, but nothing has been passed to date, as we'll discuss later in the presentation. The Section 179 limitation for 2014 also went down significantly from the 2013 figures, as I'll turn it over to Scott to talk about. One of the depreciation methods available is regular depreciation, which is also known as the Modified Accelerated Cost Recovery System, or MAKERS. Under the MAKERS system, assets are depreciated using prescribed methods and conventions. For automobiles, trucks, vans, and SUVs, Makers prescribes a five-year useful life to be taken over six tax periods under IRS guidance that, unless otherwise required, property is treated as being placed in service midway through the tax year. A taxpayer would most likely choose the double declining balance method as it provides the largest depreciation deductions in the first three years of the five-year useful life. The chart shows the depreciation allowance expressed as a percentage for a vehicle placed in service in 2014 using the maker's double declining balance method. To determine a vehicle's first year depreciation deduction using this method, take the total purchase price and multiply it by 20%. Subsequent years depreciation deductions would be calculated by multiplying the total vehicle purchase price and multiplying it by the second through fifth year percentage. After six years, the business owner has recovered 100% of the cost of the vehicle. Congress has imposed and the IRS enforces limits on the amount of depreciation expense a business owner may deduct on certain vehicle types. This limitation is based on the likelihood that a vehicle will be used for personal rather than business use. For example, a business owner is more likely to use a Chrysler 300 for personal use than a Ram truck outfitted with a snowplow or flatbed. As you can see from the graphic on the right, vehicles fall into one of three categories passenger automobiles at the bottom, then trucks, vans, and SUVs with a gross vehicle weight rating under or over 6,000 pounds. A passenger automobile includes any four-wheeled vehicle manufactured primarily for use on public streets, roads, and highways 
that has an unloaded gross vehicle weight rating of 6,000 pounds or less. As you can see, the Chrysler 300 falls under 6,000 pounds in this category. The middle category, light trucks, vans, and SUVs, meets the definition of passenger automobile and could be used for business and personal use. However, these vehicles are provided their own set of depreciation limits to reflect the higher costs associated with such vehicles. The top category, trucks, vans, and SUVs with a gross vehicle weight rating over 6,000 pounds are exempt from the depreciation limitations. Examples of this type of vehicle include Ram trucks and vans. In addition to these vehicles, certain non-personal use vehicles such as ambulances and taxis are not subject to depreciation limits. Now let's look at the depreciation limits for each of the categories. The annual depreciation limits in this table are based on 100% business use. If business use is less than 100%, the limits must be reduced to reflect the actual business use percentage. Let's look at an example. Using the Chrysler 300 example, a business owner who uses the vehicle purchased for $35,000, 80% for business use, and 20% for personal use would be allowed a first year depreciation deduction of $2,528. This is calculated by multiplying the 2014 depreciation limitation of $3,160 by 80% the business use percentage. Section 179 is a section in the Internal Revenue Code which provides an expense deduction to business owners who elect to treat the cost of qualifying property as an expense. The election is made on Form 4562 and is generally included with the business's tax return. Vehicles meeting the definition of qualifying property for purchases of Section 179. Therefore, businesses looking to maximize their depreciation deduction should consider electing Section 179 to expense all or a portion of their business vehicle purchase. For tax year 2014, the maximum Section 179 deduction is $25,000. This $25,000 limit is not per item and applies to all qualifying property purchased during the year. Section 179 also provides that the $25,000 deduction limitation is reduced if qualifying property purchases exceed $200,000 for 2014. When Section 179 is elected and an expense deduction is taken by a business, the remaining cost of a vehicle is depreciated over its five-year useful life. Business owners purchasing passenger automobiles, light trucks, vans, or SUVs may not benefit from electing Section 179 expense. The combined amounts of Section 179 expense plus the annual depreciation allowance may not exceed the first year depreciation limits provided on the previous slide. Thank you, Scott. So how does it all come together? Let's take a look at some examples. We will compare depreciation methods for two different types of vehicles. The first example, as shown on the slide, is with a luxury automobile. The company is ABC Corp, and on April 5, 2014, the business owner purchased a new passenger automobile for $30,000. Business use of the vehicle is 100%, so no calculation of personal use is necessary. The allowable depreciation for 2014 and 2015 tax years are as follows. For option one, under the regular depreciation method, the maximum amount of deduction in year 1, for 2014, is $3,160. In year 2, the amount is $5,100. The amounts for each succeeding year are listed in the luxury car limit table, as we saw a couple slides ago. On the right-hand side is option 2. The business owner elects section 179, so for year 1, the amount is limited to $3,160, and in year 2, the amount is again $5,100 because it is considered a luxury automobile. Again, please refer to the luxury auto limit tables for amounts of the remaining years. In example number two, we're going to take a look at an SUV. So in 2014, the business owner of Trevor's Electronics purchased an SUV with a gross vehicle weight rate over 6,000 pounds for $40,000. Business use of the vehicle is 100%, so again, no calculation of personal use is necessary. Here again, we have a couple of options. 
Option 1 is regular depreciation. In year 1, 2014, the depreciation expense amount is $8,000. This is calculated by taking the full cost of $40,000 times 20%, which is the rate for the first year from the regular depreciation bar graph that Scott showed us. In year 2, the rate is 32%, so $40,000 times 32% equals $12,800. Again, the rest of the years are calculated based on regular depreciation percentages. To the right of that is option two. In 2014, first we calculate the maximum section 179 amount, which, as we saw a couple slides before, for an SUV, that amount is $25,000. Then we calculate the regular depreciation amount on the remaining balance of $15,000 times the first year rate of 20%, and that portion equals $3,000. In total, $25,000 of Section 179 plus $3,000 regular equals $28,000 of depreciation expense in the first year. In 2015, because we elected Section 179 in year 1, we take the remaining balance of $15,000 times 32%, which is the year 2 rate of regular depreciation, to give us a total of $4,800. So as you can see, these tax incentives can be very powerful in the first year of purchase. Section 179 can reduce your tax bill by $8,000 in 2014, assuming a 40% tax rate. I'll turn it back over to Scott now, and he'll go through the leasing items. Generally, the costs to lease a vehicle are fully deductible for business owners. Some business owners may find that leasing a vehicle may provide a lower total cost than purchasing a vehicle. One factor that may influence your lease versus buy decision is the state you live in. Some states require the business to pay sales tax on the monthly lease payments rather than the purchase price of the vehicle. The lessee of a passenger automobile, light truck, van, or SUV used for business is required to include an additional amount in income to offset rental deductions for each tax year during which the vehicle is leased. The inclusion amount is not required for trucks, vans, and SUVs that have a gross vehicle weight rating exceeding 6,000 pounds. A lessee's inclusion amount for each tax year is determined using tables provided by the Internal Revenue Service. We have included an excerpt from these tables to aid with the following example. A Chrysler 300 placed in service on January 1, 2014 with a fair market value of $30,000 would have a first year lease inclusion of $13. The $13 lease inclusion would be reduced if the vehicle was placed in service on a later date in 2014. In this case, the inclusion amount would be prorated based on the number of days in service divided by 365 days. Let's talk about tax incentives for electric vehicles. If a small car fits your needs, there are tax incentives at both the federal and state level. At the federal level, a tax credit of up to $7,500 is available. Several conditions apply to qualify for this credit. The IRS publishes a list of eligible vehicles and the amount of credit that each one qualifies for. For example, the 2014 Fiat 500e qualifies for the full $7,500 credit. Use of the credit reduces the taxpayer's depreciable basis in the vehicle. So for example, if the taxpayer purchases a $20,000 electric vehicle and qualifies for the $7,500 credit, then that taxpayer's depreciable basis in the vehicle will be $12,500. And under makers, $2,500, or 20%, will be depreciated in the first year, $4,000, or 32%, in the second year, and so on. Many states, including California, offer tax incentives and rebates for buying or leasing electric vehicles, along with other perks such as free charging stations, free parking, and use of HOV lanes. A couple other things to consider which can be very helpful are vehicle disposition and substantiation rules. When thinking about vehicle dispositions, first is the impact of trading in an old vehicle to buy a new one. There is no gain or loss on the trade-in if it is treated as a like-kind exchange, which is similar type property. And the basis of the new vehicle is the remaining basis of the old one, plus any cash paid toward the new vehicle. For example, the old vehicle costs $30,000. Less depreciation of $10,000 leaves a remaining basis of $20,000.
for the new vehicle, it too has a cost of 30000 but there's no depreciation yet, and we paid 20000 cash. So the basis of the new vehicle is $40,000, which is the total of 20000 cash paid, plus the 20000 remaining basis of the old vehicle. Second is the impact of selling an old vehicle. The gain or loss is the difference between the basis of the old vehicle and what is received for it. Similar to the previous example, we're selling a vehicle with a cost of $30,000, less depreciation of $10,000, again leaves a remaining basis of $20,000. The vehicle is sold for $15,000, so we now have a net loss of $5,000 to deduct. If you're a business owner, here's another great point where you can leverage selling an old vehicle to buy a new one. As for substantiation rules, business owners and employees must document and keep records for the business use portion of the business vehicles. Substantiated business use is not taxable to the owner or employees. And keep in mind that commuting, your drive to and from work, is not considered business use. Things to document as proof of business use would be things such as the date, designation, business purpose for driving, and the odometer readings. Scott will now go through the final items. As mentioned, lawmakers in Washington are in favor of extending bonus depreciation assets placed in service in 2014, but there is considerable debate over how far into the future to extend this benefit to taxpayers. The primary reason is because of the many billions of dollars in tax revenue the government defers without bonus depreciation in place. The House has submitted proposed legislation with permanent extension while the Senate favors extending bonus depreciation only until the end of 2015. The President's current position is that any proposal for bonus depreciation beyond 2015 will be vetoed. It's unlikely any legislation will be finalized after the November elections, which really shortens the window for business owners trying to figure out the tax implications of their year-end buying decisions. The proposed legislation would also increase Section 179 back to its higher pre-2014 limits. The decision about a vehicle acquisition depends on the needs of the business, personal preferences on vehicle types, and tax deduction available. The allowable tax deduction may influence your vehicle purchase decision as some vehicles may provide for larger deductions and increased cash flow. Also keep in mind that proposed bonus depreciation legislation may become final in 2014 and impact the amount of depreciation deductible on your 2014 tax return. Here are some additional resources you may find of value. Thank you for your time and attention.